started. I intended to, and I will do that to explain RISAT, which stands for Replacement Sons and Daughters. If we don't raise young people to follow in our footsteps everything that uh, we'll do will collapse. Uh, in the Bible, it talks a lot about generations. One generation telling the next generation the great things that God has done. So that there will be memory, memory of God working amongst us. Uh, one scripture in in uh, Psalms <clears throat> talks, I think, about four generations. Uh, this generation telling another generation, we shall tell, tell another generation. <clears throat> uh, and it talks about about four generations. I think it's Psalm 78. Psalm 78. All my people listen to my teaching. Open your ears to what I am saying. For I will speak to you in a parable. I will teach hidden lessons from our past. Then verse 3 in Psalm 78 says, Stories we have heard and know, stories of ancestors. NIV says, uh, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have taught us. So there's the generation of our fathers, telling their children, and then verse 4 says, we will not hide it, we will not hide these things from their children. So there are three generations already, our fathers, us, our children, telling them the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. And then it says, he decreed statues for Jacob. He established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers. Now it goes now beyond, he talked about our father. Now he goes beyond our father to the forefathers. There's the generation of the forefathers. There's the generation of the fathers. It's, there's our generation. There's the generation of the children, our children. He says, he decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. Their children is our fathers. Our forefathers taught their children, their children is our fathers. Our fathers taught us, uh, and we have a responsibility to teach. Then verse 6 says, so the next generation would know, even the children yet to be born. That's the fifth generation. Is the forefathers, is the fathers, it's us, is our children. And then there's the fifth generation, those are not born yet, so that they may tell, so that they in turn would tell their children. It's talking about those are not born yet. And those are not born yet will tell their children. Six generations. Aye. Why? Then they would put their trust in God. 
That's verse 6. Verse 7. So that they put their trust in God. Forefathers, fathers, us, our children, those not yet born, and they also will tell their children six generations and they, they are having one thing. They are talking about God so that they would trust in God. They would not forget his deeds. Who would tell his deeds? Our forefathers will tell their, our fathers. Our fathers will tell us. We will tell our children. We will tell the generation not yet born. And they in turn will tell their children about God. <clears throat> so that they will trust God. They will not forget <clears throat> his deeds. But would keep his commands. So when we thought of research, we're thinking of the generation <clears throat> that is even younger than the generation we called a jet generation. Jet generation is the generation of Zandile that age group, those who are working, <clears throat> maybe they've been working for the past three, four years. It's not long after they graduated. But, but there's a generation before, uh, after them. Uh, those who are in university, first year, second year students at university, there's that generation. And that generation is going to be targeting those in high school, junior secondary school and high school, teaching them about God, what God has done for humanity, uh, teaching them about the purpose of God on earth, what God wants to achieve on earth, teaching them about uh, responsibility, how to, to serve God, how to have a burden for the lost, how to reach out to those who do not know Christ, how to disciple them when they've come to Christ. That was the idea, we call them replacement sons and daughters. We want to thank God that the judge generation is coming up. Uh, they are responsible. You, you can see them running around, uh, organizing meetings, helping us when we run the school. Uh, they, are, they are really serving God. Um, they are serving God. <clears throat> they are doing so in the midst of many, many other responsibilities. <clears throat> we can see that emerging. <clears throat> now, what about the generation before them? Uh, so this meeting was organized also for that generation. Help them to be saved. <clears throat> help them to be stable in their salvation. Help them to realize that every human being born on earth is not born just to serve their employers only. We are not on earth to work for the government, <clears throat> to work in the private sector, and spend all our lives <clears throat> serving Coca-Cola company, serving banks, 
serving the government and doing nothing for God. That's not what we're created for. If all we do <clears throat> in our lives is to chase livelihood, and we are so diligent in working for money, nobody reminds you to wake up early in the morning to go and serve your boss. And you serve your boss from 8 o'clock in the morning to 5 in the evening. Some of you take your work home, and that is your life five days a week, six days a week. And there's a God who must be served. There's the kingdom of darkness uh, that must be plundered. There's a kingdom of God that, that must be built. And a young people must be taught. Young people must be taught that there's a God to be served. They must be taught that you can't work all your life working for a, for a university. All your life. I mean all your life. Expand all your energy for a university. For for an institution here on earth in order to earn money. And what you do does not have a kingdom dimension. There's no kingdom dimension at all. <clears throat> There's no idea that God has placed me at this university in order to represent him. And I do so consciously. My office is always full of students who come and I talk to them about Christ. That consciousness is not there. Now we raised them this group of young people called Risat. Uh, in order to tell them that uh, you were created by God. You are saved by God in order for you to serve him in your youth. To serve him in your youth. You serve, to serve God in your youth. To be a force to be reckoned with. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were forced in Babylon. Young people at the age of 16, 17, they shook. They shook the whole kingdom of, of Babylon. And we felt that these young people must not take over from us when we are dead. Because when we are dead, they cannot ask us questions. If we are training Zandile and Tulang and others, they can ask us questions we are still alive. Why do you do things this way? What is the rationale behind it? You can't go to the grave and ask people who are dead why they do things the way they do them. And therefore we felt that these young people must be trained while we are still alive. They must be trained while we're still alive. Some of them are able now to welcome people. They're able to lead prayers. They are able to do things and we can watch them. We can correct them when they do things. That was the purpose of research. Uh, training young people, mobilizing young people to impact their own generation, who will impact their own generation up to the sixth 
generation. That's the idea. That's the idea. And when we used to meet in person, the book that I wrote, You've Got a Bright Future, Don't Mess It Up. It came from the meetings we had, 2016. Um, in that place we, we, where we used to meet, more, I mean, teaching young people, mobilizing them, envisioning them, realizing that Paul says, don't let anyone undermine your youth. First Timothy 4.12, don't let anyone undermine your youth. But live your life as a young person to be exemplary. And Paul uh, says that these young people would be exemplary in many areas. These young people will be exemplary in many areas. Let's do the areas. First Timothy <clears throat> chapter 4. Areas in which these young people will be exemplar. First Timothy chapter 4. And the idea here was that these young people would be exemplar even to older generation. Older people learning from young people who are exemplar. Don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example. Set an example. And he says, for the believers. <clears throat> when he says, set an example for the believers, he means adult believers, young people, who are focused, who know what they are doing, who realize that they are not on earth by accident, who realize that <clears throat> they are not just consumers. They are not just consumers. They are contributors. <clears throat> then is, there must be an example for believers in speech. He, he delineates areas in which they must be exemplary. Number one, the way they speak. <clears throat> My wife and I were watching a program after I dressed for, before I could rest. As I say, I, I worked the whole night, literally the whole night. Then we watched a program in Limpompo of young people, one is the chairperson of, uh, is it NYPD, the program of uh, ANC, <clears throat> which deals with development. That young lady was so articulate. She was incredible. And then there was a young lady who is an accountant who was helped by the Solomon Matlangu Scholarship Fund. And she, the things she was saying, that we got money from the government, I am an accountant now, and I have raised money, I support a thousand students. Uh, somewhere she, 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 she mentioned. But they are, these young people are serving. And Masha Adela was there, was sitting down, and other adults were sitting down. They were being lectured, lectured to by young people. Where are we going to get such caliber of young people amongst us now? 
who will be examples for believers, mark that. It does not say example for other young people. He says we want young people to be examples for believers. One in speech. In speech. They say something that is sound. Something we can listen to. There must be examples, number two, in life. <clears throat> Where are the young people whose life is exemplary to us adults? <clears throat> we learn from them. They are exemplary in love. Here, not them, is not talking about young people, romantic love. It's not talking about that. Young people falling in love with other young people, sleeping with them and leaving them with children. But loving the brethren, young people who are exemplary in the area of expressing love for, for God, uh, love for the purpose of God, love for the Bible, love for humanity. Uh, they must be exemplary in love. Then it says they must be exemplary in faith. Do we have young people who believe God? Like the young people I have had who were trained, they passed high school. And then they went to Russia to start in Russia. They learned Russia. They started witnessing to other people in Russia to understand that there was a program <clears throat> that is run in Russia, started by young people in faith. Do young people believe God? Have they been taught to believe God? When they are facing challenges, monetary challenges, <clears throat> health challenges, do they depend on the faith of their parents? Or do, do they so believe God that even their parents will learn from them? Like a young person who believed God, the parents did not have money to send this child to, to university. But the child said, God, this child said, God wants me to be educated. I will go to university. God is going to raise money. I will pursue this course of study. And the parents were watching. And indeed, God came through, and this young person went to university, studied until she, 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 she completed a degree. And the parents are saying, I've never seen a person having as much faith as my daughter. Exemplar in the area of faith. Exemplary in the area of purity. Ah, I was surprised by that. Purity. You didn't think that young people can be associated with impurity. I mean with purity. To an extent that they would live such pure lives that adults would admire them and would learn purity from them. I was talking to one young person uh, not so long ago, maybe two or three weeks ago, we were dealing with fish or something. And then things, this young person was wrestling with the issue of whether what he wanted to do was ethical or not. Um, and it was a small thing, but 
she did not take that small thing lightly. Uh, she was wrestling with it. Is it ethical? How many young people raise the issue of ethics? How many? Who are wrestling in their hearts. They don't want to do anything that is un unethical. It does not matter how small it is. They want to interrogate it first. Is it all right? Is it ethical? That encouraged me uh, greatly. And so young people have to be raised who espouse uh, these high standards, who, who, who must know that they can be an example for believers. Not for young people. They can be exemplary for believers. And therefore, we started this program called Resad in order to raise this quality of young people. And the idea was to start from junior secondary school. They are old enough to be understanding these things, to be confronted with these things. Deal with uh, high school students, give them career guidance, help them to aspire to go to university and have degrees, not in order to earn money, <clears throat> primarily. But N degrees, which will open doors of opportunity for service. Once they are professionals, they have a voice. They have a voice in society. Now to be told, told that they can use that voice for the expansion of the kingdom of God. That's the idea. So that's why I am so worried when we have a meeting like this, we've got three young people and the rest are adults. And you are not even sure if, if these adults will take what, what is being taught and take it to, 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 to young people. Or whether they'll write, take, take down their notes and it ends there. It ends there. And the big issue we wanted these young people to know are two. One, to be saved to be stable in their faith, to know the Bible, to know the Bible, to assess, to assess situations according to the word of God. When I was a young person, myself, and then there were young people that uh, came up uh, under be behind us. When someone was preaching, they would ask the question, where is this thing found in the Bible? They themselves knew the Bible. And they would say, no, what this man is preaching is not from the word of God. So we want them to be saved. We want them to know the Bible and to know Bible doctrines. The Bible teaches doctrine. To know Bible doctrine. Not to be illiterate about that. 
for them to be engaged in discipleship, winning other young people to Christ, discipling them, passing on to other young people what we have passed on to them. That was the idea. And they can't do that unless they are grounded in their faith. That's number three. We wanted young people who are grounded in their faith, who are stable. We can send them to Russia and we know that they will not defect. We can send them to America to go and study and we are not afraid that they will imbibe the, the wrong thing that is that are done in America to be grounded in their faith. To raise young people who know that there's something called a revival. That's number four, young people to know about revival and to be committed to labor for revival. To labor for revival. They are so good in uh, all this type of media. Uh, they are so good. They could use WhatsApp, they could use all these platforms uh, for the right reasons. And then number five, more importantly, for them to serve God, to serve God, to work. This is where now we wanted to train them. How do you, how do you, how do you write a bad start? They must know that. They must be able to sit down and write a good Bible study that could be used. Maybe a Bible study, a young person who is a, a, a female who has a problem about young girls who are being used and exploited. Uh, to write a, a Bible study about purity, about virtue, and so forth. How do they do that? How do you start a meeting? How do you anchor a meeting? I want to pass that on to them. The big word, we don't want them to be consumers only. We want them to be contributors. I was listening today and I was so impressed. A man called Seth Mazibuko. <clears throat> and this man was saying that <clears throat> he was meeting with young people. Hey, that was amazing. These young people said, why do you give us grant for getting children? Young people asking that question. Why do you encourage us to get children and you give us grant for that? What can you give us grant for other things other than getting children? Why do you give us grant for, for getting children? And then the young people said, we don't like this education that you're giving to us. And we will, we will come up with a syllabus ourselves of the kind of education that we want to get. Young people, young people in Soweto. Uh, we want to talk to you about economy. We want to talk about the kind of health service we want to get, and we are going to draw up uh, programs that describes describe in details what we want. Young people said, we want to be in the boardrooms. We want to be in parliament. We don't want you to talk for us in parliament. We want to talk for us. Now, where, where do we get young people amongst us now? We we'll say, Prof, we can see what you've been doing. It's all right. But we want, to, we, we want now to tell you how we want things to be done. 
Who would not sit down with, with such young people? Who would not? Would come up and say, we appreciate what you've been doing. It can be done this way and that way. Service, servicing, serving God and serving humanity. That was the idea of the starting result. Now in our centers, we can't even mobilize young people. Ah. You, we can't mobilize young people. We can't be talking to young people. We cannot be talking to young people. And it's a program that comes only once a year. We've been doing it for years now. Um, 16 and 17. Usually we'd start sometimes if the 16th is on a Wednesday, we'd meet on the 15th at night and then have a program on the 16th. We started it a long time ago while I was still with Living Seat team. We've always had meetings in Mtata. Oh. Something must be done. Something must be done. We prayed about the theme. And this theme did not come from me. It came from a young person. It's a young person who said, I think the theme should be standing firm. It resonated with my spirit, yes. We should be standing firm. That's the theme, standing firm. What is the opposite of standing? It's falling. That's the opposite of standing, it's falling. It's either you stand or you fall. No, we want, we want to encourage young people to stand. Daniel stood, Sheldrake, Michigan, Abingo stood, Esther stood, Joseph stood, standing. And we chose the word standing deliberately. God chose the word standing, not stand, but standing. Grammatically standing is a present continuous tense. It's not past tense. It's a present continuous tense. What does it mean? It means I started standing. I am standing. I'll continue to be standing. That's the impact. So we want the young people. Our sister read a scripture, Psalm 37, verse 25. I've been young. Now I am old. I've never seen the Russians forsaken. We want young people who are standing, who will continue to stand until they reach adulthood until they reach our age and they continue to work and still be standing. Standing. But they are not standing anyhow. They are not, they are standing firm. They are standing firmly. They are firm in their standing. We want young, young people like that who when they go to university and others are drinking wine and uh, they're uh, misbehaving, the young people will stand firm on the word of God. 
resolutely. Young people who are resolved, who are determined, young people who are unchangeable, unchangeable, uh, who are unyielding, unyielding young people. Young people are not flex, who are inflexible. Who are inflexible when people are doing things that are wrong? They say, no, you can call me outdated and so forth. Who are inflexible when it comes to the things of God? Standing firm. Standing firm. One day, I was driving to Deben to conduct a meeting for young people. <clears throat> That's when I was still working for the Living Seed team. Now I'm praying on the way to Devon, Lord, what is the issue with young people? What do you want me to say to young people? We're driving with other young people going to Devon. And God said something that uh, astounded me. He said, young people are as unstable as water. That's, that's what he said exactly. Young people are as un, unstable as water. When there is water running in a certain direction, you can divert the direction of the water by digging a furrow and let the water now move in that direction. Young people are so impressionable, so easy to influence for good and also for evil. And now God gives us the theme standing firm. Standing firm. Standing firm. If you're insulted, it's all right. If you're called names, it's all right. Standing firm. He gave us that theme. Now, as I was praying, I sensed to give young people a chief speech, to give them a collection of scriptures and make a few comments on those scriptures. Will that help them to stand firm? Will it help them to stand firm? Or do you give them principles of standing firm? Do you tell them the secret of standing firm? Do you equip them in such a way that if you were to be alive 60 years from now, you'll find that the young people that you talk to are still standing firm. That's the issue I was wrestling with. How do we help the young people to stand firm? How do we help them? So that you don't have to be there, they will go they will go to university, stand firm. They'll get a job in Cape Town, they'll stand firm. They can even get a, a job overseas, 
in Ireland, in the UK, in the US, they will stand firm. <clears throat> How do we equip them in such a way that they will stand firm for life? And then God gave such an elaborate teaching, an elaborate teaching, first of all, on the three tenses, T-E-N-S-E, -E, a tense, past tense, present tense, future tense. The three tenses of salvation. If they don't understand the three tenses of salvation, I was saved. I am saved. I will be saved. If they don't understand that, if they don't understand that it's not enough for them to have been saved, Past tense. Because salvation that took place in the past is mere history. It's mere history. I got saved in the year 2000. It was in a meeting in a certain place. So-and-so was preaching. You are narrating history. And history is important because it is the foundation. So it's important to have that historical foundation of having been saved in the past. But what is important is you're being saved today and tomorrow and day after tomorrow and next week and next month. That's not important, to remain saved. And you're being saved in the present will influence whether you'll be saved in the future. Ah, oh, that's so important. If you're not saved presently, even though you are saved in the past, you're being saved in the past. If you are not saved presently, it won't help you. You won't go to heaven because you are saved in the past. No. Oh. No. What is being? What is important? Are you saved? For how long will you be saved? Will you remain saved as God takes you to different places? If you are a professional, you will. Uh, there will be occasions when there's a meeting in a hotel. When your place of employment will have a meeting in a hotel, and in that hotel there will be all kinds of things that will be wine and some people think that wine is not liquor and therefore I can take a little bit of wine and that's how they started drinking will you be saved in a hotel will you be saved if your university your place where you work has a a strategic planning play meeting in St. Lucia somewhere and in all there. You are there with the men who are not born again. Some of them are almost your age. They don't know Christ. When you're in that meeting, they see an opportunity to exploit you. Will you be saved? Are you saved? Are you saved in your secret place? I was saved. 
I am saved. I will be saved. Tonight I'll just deal with the past tense of the word. The past tense dimension of salvation. That's what, I, what I'll be discussing tonight. And then we'll call it a night. The past tense dimension of salvation. The first scripture I want to read to you is 2 Corinthians 1 verse 10, which talks about all three tenses in what that one scripture says. It says, who delivered us from so great a death, who doeth deliver us, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. If you read that scripture, in King James Version, it has those, those three tenses. Salvation is deliverance. Even though Paul here was talking about physical deliverance. But it is applicable even to spiritual deliverance. That scripture in the King James Version shows all these three tenses. He delivered us, past tense. He does deliver us, present tense. We trust he will yet deliver us, future tense. Salvation has lost Three tenses, very important, very important. Now, when we deal with the past tense then, particularly, we're going to look at two scriptures, particularly, deliverance particularly. The first scripture is the scripture that you know very well, Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved. That's past tense. Once a verb ends with a D, it's past tense. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. If you are going to stand firm, You must have a clear history of, of having been saved. That's the foundation. That's the foundation. If we don't have that history of how you were saved, where you were saved, when you were saved, how, where, when. You can't stand firm. If one may ask you, tell us a history of your salvation, then you waffle. When you speak, we cannot, we, can, we cannot hear clearly what happened. What happened? On what are you standing? On what are you standing? There are some young people that I know and adults who were saved in the past 
And when they were introduced to the understanding that salvation includes dying to self and Christ being your life. I know some young people, some people say, who will then trace their salvation, not to the salvation they got in 1970, 1980, but to the salvation they got in 2006, 2010, when the idea of understanding what salvation actually means We say, I was saved, but I realized that my salvation was deficient. And then God explained salvation in its fullness. Then I embraced it. Do we have young people like that? Who say, I was at the university, I was saved. Then I was exposed to the truth in my uh, discipleship center. I committed my life afresh. I am now correctly saved. I am now correctly saved. So it's important. That salvation in the past becomes a rock on which you stand. And if you're not clear, about having been saved in the past. You've got no, you've got no standing. You've got no place, secure place on which you're standing. And therefore you should never be hesitant. You should never be hesitant to give your life to Christ again and to be properly saved. Don't be afraid to do that because your standing will be shaky if the issue of your, your salvation is not clear. The second verse we want to read about salvation in the past, Titus uh, chapter 3, Verses 3 to 7. Titus uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. What is interesting here in this verse, in this passage of scripture, very interesting, is that it describes the life one lived before one was saved. It talks about how a person was saved. And it talks about uh, why we were saved. Let's read it. Titus uh, chapter 3, verses 3 to 7 says, at chapter 3, verses 3 to 7, it says, at one time, we too were foolish. You must remember the time when you were foolish. We have some of you as a young person, were so foolish that uh, you lost your virginity in that foolishness. Don't gloss over, don't gloss over your foolishness. At one time, we too were foolish. That's verse three. What did we do? We were disobedient, not only to our parents, but also to God. We were deceived. I think those, those descriptive words must write them down. 
How were we in the past? One, we're foolish. How were we in the past? Number two, we're disobedient. How were we in the past? Number three, we're deceived. So he's explaining, he's giving very wonderful words. If we could try them as number one, number two, number three, we're foolish, number one. We were disobedient, number two. We were deceived. We were deceived. Who deceived us? The devil. The devil deceived us. And that deception had consequences. Some of those consequences are living with us. We were foolish. We were disobedient, we were deceived. Then he says, we were enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Ah. We were enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. All of us were like that, by the way. All of us, even us adults, there was a time when we were foolish. And we did things foolishly. We did not know any better. There was a time when we were disobedient to God. God says, you should not do the following, and we did. God said, do the following, and we didn't. We were disobedient. We were also deceived, and one of the deception that we suffer from was that sinful practices, we call them nice time. That's deception. Sinful practices, we call them nice time. If I went out with a boyfriend over the weekend and we went to expensive hotel, we tell our friends we had a nice time. Deception. Deception. But we were enslaved. We were enslaved. The Bible says, he who commits sin is a slave to sin. We're enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Number five, we lived in malice. Let me get a, an easier word. Number five, we lived in malice. NLT says, we're foolish, we're disobedient, we're misled. Deceived, he used the word misled, by others and became slaves to many wicked desires and evil pleasures. Our lives are full of evil and envy, malice. Malice. Does that describe our past? Malice. Number six, who were envious. We were envious. We always were envying this and that and that. We were envious. Envying cars, envying clothes, envying this, envying. We were envious. Number seven, we were hated. And we also hated. There are people who hated, and there are people who hated us. We were hated, and we also hated. All of us have gone through that. But what is interesting and is encouraging is the word we were. I'm encouraged by that. 
if you claim to be saved, you are still foolish. You are saved, you are still disobedient. You are saved, you are still deceived. You are saved, you are still enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. You are saved, but you, you still live in malice. You still live in malice. You are saved, but you still live in malice. Ah. You are saved and you are still envious. You are saved, but there are still people that you hate. And there are people who hate you. Then your 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 salvation is questionable. We're talking about the salvation presently. You claim to be saved, but it is still characterized by that. Your salvation is questionable. That's why in uh, the various centers, we need to interrogate how people, if we're doing things correctly, we would have a file for every person who becomes a disciple. And the first question that you ask is, how were you saved? To assess whether this person is really truly saved or not. Then I'm very happy that verse 4 begins with the word but. Once, once you bring the word but, it's a contrast. The word but usually shows contrast. I was hungry, but now I've eaten. I was tired, I took a nap, but now I'm fresh. So it describes the seven things that characterize our lives in the past. Then verse 4 says, But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Question number two we ask, is talk about your past? Then it talks about still in the past, God appeared. Ah, oh, God appeared. Has God ever appeared to you? Can you tell us how God appeared to you? God appeared. Where did God appear to you? How did God appear to you? When did God appear to you? But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. You can't be saved without God appearing to you. It's not possible. You are saved when God appears to you. And you'll know when he appeared to you, how he appeared to you, where he appeared to you. God must appear to you. We're saved. Now notice it says, we were saved. When he appeared to me, he saved me. Past tense. Not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. So that having been justified, Let's write down the word justified. It's going to be important. Having been justified by his grace, we might become as having the hope of eternal life. There's a lot that is said there. 
So it's important to have this clear history. By the way, history can be updated. Have this clear history of your salvation. Then we can talk. Then your present tense salvation is based on your past tense salvation. And if anybody claims to be saved and you ask them to give a testimony of their salvation and they can't give that testimony, you conclude they are not saved. If they can't give a clear testimony of what happened, they are not saved. That's important. Now, let's go to the next point, point number two. Point number one, we're dealing with scriptures, which deal with the past tense dimension of our salvation. But now, what does it deal with? That's point number two, which is very important. The past tense dimension of our salvation it deals with the penalty of sin. The Bible says we're justified. We'll talk about that. It deals with the penalty of sin. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. It does not refer to physical death. It refers to what the Bible calls the second death. Death always means separation. Death always means separation. When you are physically dead, you are separated from those who are living. When you are spiritually dead, you are separated from God and you will spend eternity in a godless place. All have sinned, for the ways of sin is death, I'm sorry, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So when you sinned in the past, The wrath of God was upon you. There was penalty. And the penalty is that you would have gone to hell for the rest of your life. That's the penalty. Penalty of sin. Sin has penalty. Just like breaking the law has penalty. Sin has penalty. Our save from that penalty, which is to go to hell for the rest of my life. That's the penalty. I was saved from it in the past. Romans 8, verse 1. Romans 8, verse 1 says, Therefore, there is now, oh, present. There's the then and the now. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Oh. oh, in order for me to escape the penalty of all the sins I committed in the past, I must receive Jesus as, as my Lord and Savior. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. When you are saved, the Bible says you are in Christ. 
you are in Christ. Then Romans uh, chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25. It's a very good scripture. It says, this says, all have sinned. All have sinned. And they come short of the glory of God. All have sinned. Then it says, but they are justified freely. They are justified freely by his grace. Through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Justified freely, redeemed. Two things happened. One, justified. Two, redeemed. And they both come from Christ. That's verse 24. 25, God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement. In this one passage, we get three words that I, we get three words that are important. Number one, justification. Number two, redemption. Number three, atonement. Salvation involves those three. Justification, redemption, atonement. What is, what is justification? Justification is acquittal. Acquittal. You had committed a crime. You went to court. And the case was discussed. And you were acquitted. You are not, you are not guilty. You are not. You 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 were not found guilty. You were declared guiltless. Justification. When Christ saves you, he removes guilt and penalty. That's important. You, you were acquitted and therefore you are not guilty. You're not guilty. So when you are properly saved, you are not get guilty of all the foolishness you did in the past, your deceit, your envy, all the things that we talked about. God says, I don't hold you guilty for them. Why? Redemption. Maybe let's go to atonement first. Why? It's because the price was paid. Atonement, the price was paid for your sins. You are not acquitted whimsically. You are not, a, you're not just acquitted. You were, you were acquitted because someone paid the price for your sins. And then number three, you were redeemed. What is to redeem? To redeem is to buy back. Even in, in economic terms, they use the word to redeem, to buy back. To buy, to buy back. So even though we're created by God and we belong to God, we sold ourselves to Satan and we became slaves to Satan. Now Christ came and said, I'm buying them back. 
usually when they speak of redemption in the Bible, it gives the picture of a camp where all slaves are kept. During the time of slavery, the uh, people went to a place where slaves were covered and camped. And you say, I choose that slave. Maybe that slave is tall, is strong bodily, and you choose that slave. Choosing that slave, it means you are buying them out of the camp where slaves are kept. Now this slave was going to live in your house and do the work in your house. When you are saved, Christ buys you from a slave camp, a slave camp where all uh, sinners are kept. He buys you back from there to belong to his house and to pursue the things that the one who bought you wants you to do. You pursue that. Another scripture you could read, I will not read it, but I'll just cite it. It's 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 to 11. 1 Corinthians, I said 1 Corinthians, yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. Study it. <clears throat> now, God is dealing with your past tense dimension of your salvation. You need to be looking at that and see, are you really saved? Were you truly saved? Was your understanding of salvation adequate? Must your understanding of salvation be augmented? Must we add something to your salvation for you to be truly, truly saved so that we know that you, you are properly, properly saved? That's important. It's important we answer that question. If you will stand firm, If those questions are not answered that are raised about your experience of salvation in the past, was it sufficient? Was it correct? Was it biblical? What happened? If you can answer those questions, you can't stand firm. You can't stand firm at all. What is the one thing that happened when you're saved, apart from being justified, being redeemed, and being, being atoned for? Is there anything lacking in your salvation? And now, that kind of salvation, what did it do? Let me mention one important thing that that it did. It reconciled you with God. When the issue of your sins was settled, we'll talk about tomorrow the sinful nature was dealt with. You received Christ as your life. <clears throat> then you are reconciled with God. Romans 5 verse 10. For if when we were, I like it, all it speaks of a past tense. If, for if when we were God's enemies, 
Oh. I didn't realize that when I was not saved, I was an enemy of God. I didn't. But the Bible says I was. It says then we were reconciled to him. Our salvation reconciles us to God the Father. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. The dying of Christ was a means of reconcil reconciling us with God or to God. Why? Because it dealt with my sins. And the fact that they were paid for atonement, the fact that I was redeemed, I was brought back out of the slave camp of sin, if those things happened correctly, correctly, then you are reconciled uh, to God the Father. Reconciliation is very, very critical. Verse 10, for if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Oh, we are saved through the life of Jesus. Romans 5 verse 10 I'm saved through the life of Jesus. When I'm saved, Jesus took my rotten life, put it on the cross, and instead he gave me his own righteous life. Oh, then I became a friend of God. That's important to know. That is important to know. I was reconciled. Now God is my father. And God is my friend. He's my father. He's my friend. There's a good relationship between me and God. To understand what took place when you were saved in the past, you must also understand Romans 3. Verse 25. Romans 3 verse 25 says, He did this to demonstrate his justice. Because of his forbearance as patience, he left, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. That's the point I want to stress about your salvation in the past. You will not be punished. He left the sins committed in the past unpunished. You won't be you won't be punished for the sins you did in the past. There's no need for you to feel guilty about them. No. Even if you aborted children, two or three wishes, and abortion is murder. You did that. You. You have been saved. You have escaped the punishment of your past sins. So you need to be focusing now on your present status. You should be worried about that. That's important. So we, we're now explaining the past tense the past tense dimension of, of our salvation. Now, as we're explaining this, where do you stand? Are you really saved? Are you correctly saved? Are you fully saved? Real saved? Fully saved? 
completely saved? If you can, you cannot answer that question, you've got to kneel down before God and say, oh God, reveal the nature of my salvation. Is it correct? I can't stand on wrong salvation. I cannot stand firm on wrong salvation. I cannot. So Lord, correct my salvation so that I can stand firmly on my salvation. Let's end there. And then we'll talk about the present tense of our salvation and what it entails. I'm trusting that these verses have clarified some things. You have understood what happened. How did I live in the past? How did I transit from the past to the present? How, how completely, adequately saved am I? And if there are some dimensions of your salvation in the past which have not been met, then we can pray with you and help you to be properly and adequately saved so that if Christ were to come tonight, uh, I would be part of those who will be raptured to go to heaven. I will not remain in this life. I'll go to heaven. Because I am I I have been properly saved. I've been fully saved. I've been correctly saved. I want to spend just a minute for us to reflect at and look at our salvation in the past. And we pray that God the Holy Spirit will be showing you deficiencies in your salvation. And then you can correct those deficiencies. Let's keep quiet for a minute. We'll continue tomorrow building on what you've talked about today. You can't stand firm if your salvation is not clear, if your salvation is not correct, if your salvation is not adequate. We are not adequately saved. As we close tonight, reflect on that. And if you want to talk to us about it, you want to be sure that you are correctly saved, you are fully saved. There are no defects in your salvation. Then you've got a solid ground on which you can stand firm. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you for tonight. Uh, we raised some issues about how we're doing things. Please help us not, not just to continue to do things uh, because there are no questions. Help us to explore ways in which you could be effective in the various ministries that the church, that's, that this work has. Lord, give us a good night's rest. Thank you for those who have come. We pray that the different centers will continue to invite young people to come to their program. We thank you, Father, and we bless you. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Actually, goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives 
and they shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Thank you for being here this first night. We'll meet tomorrow. Uh,